October of 1944, the German Volkssturm was decreed into existence. And essentially, in some ways very much like the British Home Guard, the idea was that older men, uh, predominantly World War I veterans, but many others as well, would be enrolled into what we would call local area defence. The idea was, very much like the British Home Guard, is that when the invading enemy was approaching your town or your city, you would be called out, you'd leave your factory, you'd leave your offices, take your weapons and go and fight, basically. Now, um, the problem was, though, that by October, November 1944, Germany was not just running short of men to fight, it was also running very short of weapons, uniforms, equipment and much else besides. So one of the defining features of the German Volkssturm was that it was equipped with a great variety of weapons, uniforms and indeed clothing. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Now one of the first defining features of Volkssturm are our wonderful armbands. You may notice that all members of the Volkssturm are wearing armbands. My colleague down here is wearing the official um, red and black armband. My colleague over here is wearing, wearing a more uh, homemade white one, my own one also would be a locally made yellow one. And why are we all wearing armbands? Well, under the Geneva Convention, even if you're not wearing a uniform as such, remember Germany's running out of uniforms and much else, if you're wearing a very high-vis armband that identifies you as a combatant, then you are treated as a soldier rather than as a terrorist or a partisan because you are advertising to the world that you are a combatant. So all the Vulture, all the folks of the Vulture German members, we must wear our armbands because that is meant to designate whether you're wearing military equipment, as my colleague down here, my colleague over here is wearing a more factory civilian outfit. That designates you as a combatant and entitled to the rights of a soldier under the Geneva Convention. Now that works fine if you're fighting the British or the Americans or the Canadians or the French. They've all signed the Geneva Convention and generally the Western Allies respect The problem though on the Eastern Front was that the Soviet Union had never signed, never has signed the Geneva Convention. So, unfortunately, on the Eastern Front, if the Volkssturm are captured, they're very often shot out of hand as terrorists because the Soviets did not recognise this generally as designating you as a combatant. So what you find with the Volkssturm is they tend to fight very ferociously against the Russians. What's their alternative? Executed, possibly. If they're lucky, they're going to go for a long, free holiday. Siberia, whereas in the West, if you've got the Americans or the British or the Canadians, there generally you can safely surrender. And we know a very big disparity between the combat performance of the Volkswagen fighting in the West and the Volkswagen fighting in the East. In the West, very commonly, British, American, Canadian towns itself of approaching German towns and cities. They could often see the Volkswagen firing off their ammunition just to get rid of it so they could then legitimately surrender if they run out of ammo. That doesn't happen on the Eastern Front, there they have to fight. Now, to give you one idea of the big difference between the British Home Guard and the German Home Guard, the Volkswagen, obviously, as I'm sure you know, the British Home Guard never fired a shot in anger uh, unless you count a rather bizarre episode in 19. Where a shot down German Luftwaffe guy in a JU 88 decided to shoot it out with the Essex Home Guard. All very exciting, lasted two minutes, and no one got hurt. But the British Home Guard very much are what you see in some ways in that army on the TV. The German Volkssturm is a very, 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 very different war. They get to fight. Obviously, Germany is being, from their point of view, invaded by the Allies from east and west, and they fight. And we 
know from Red Cross and other archives, about eight to 900,000 men and some women are recruited into the Volkswagen and we know from the records that about 150,000 are killed in combat with another 300,000 wounded. So if you were recruited into the Volkswagen, you've roughly got a one in two chance of not being killed or wounded. So a very, 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 very different experience of the Real. Now, having said that, as I said at the start, the vast majority of the men being enrolled into the Volkswagen, they're men in their 40s, 50s, and some as old as 70, and they are generally World War I veterans. So they did have some understanding of the generality of war. And one of the reasons you'll see many of us wearing these lovely coloured ribbons, these are actually representing World War I decoration because this is the generation in the Volkswagen. Having said that, does not mean in any way that they are enthusiastic. They've been through World War I. The last thing they wanted was to fight in World War II, but you don't get to say no in Nazi Germany. So even though you often find a great lack of enthusiasm, if you get the directive to turn up and go out into the fighting line, you've got no choices. Because if you don't, well, you'll end up, and I'm not exaggerating here, hanging from a lamppost by piano wire. And you see, sadly, a lot of that at the end of World War I, where the Nazis are actually executing anyone who is not showing the right offensive spirit. So even if you want to surrender, you've got to be very careful how you go about it, because unfortunately, it could be very, very, very nasty otherwise. Now, as I was indicating earlier, the Volkssturm, very little of military equipment is available. So the first thing is, what military equipment we do get is a great mismatch. It's literally whatever is left at the bottom of the cupboard. So, on my right, my colleague here is generally dressed as you'd expect a normal German soldier at the end of World War I to be dressed. He has got his lovely Stahlhelm helmet. He's generally got normal German equipment, clothing and weapons. Whereas on my left, in a sense, you have the opposite end of the spectrum, though just as common in the Volkswagen, with his factory overalls on, his working boots, and he would literally they used to come like that from the factory line, get a rifle, whatever, straight into the front line. And I'm probably somewhere in the middle. Um, now, the other thing we're getting on is a lot of different weapons. Again, Germany's running out of weapons. They're not we get a few standard weapons, but many of the weapons we get are either captured Allied weapons, weapons from France, uh, Holland, Denmark, that sort of thing, Russia, and or weapons from the police. And what we have here is a variety of weapons. Again, I'll start on my right. My colleague here is armed with the German copy of a Sten gun. A Sten gun that the British had evolved in 1940, cheap and cheerful to manufacture. The Germans, in their desperation at the end of World War II, were manufacturing a German copy. Big difference is they put the magazine on the bottom. Why do they do that? Rather than on the side, on the British Den gun, it's for the silhouette. When you're in combat, you're often firing at the, the silhouette of your enemy. You don't want to be carrying a weapon, which I'm actually carrying, um, that resembles a Sten gun, because you might just get shot. So that's why they put the magazine called MG3008. Other than that, it's a faithful copy of the British Den gun. Works quite well, but it's all metal, simple, cheap, rapid to manufacture. On my left, my colleague is boasting a beautiful French Labelle rifle. This particular one, dated 1917. Now this one went through World War I, captured obviously in 1940 when France falls. Germans capture over a million of these rifles, along with a lot of French ammunition. Now, ammunition's always very important, because a gun ain't no use without ammunition. So we are getting French ammunition with this. So he would have been issued this lovely bolt action, World War I rifle, and you get 50 rounds of ammunition. Sounds like a lot, trust me, in reality it's not. 
I, on the other hand, am carrying another category of weapons, MP25, and it is issued to German police. Very expensive to manufacture, that's why it never went into use by the German army, but the German police used it, it uses nine standard 9mm parabellum. Um, very lovely gun, except it's actually quite heavy, so I'm very glad when I put it down in a minute. So you've got, as it were, a German last ditch weapon, weapons that we're getting from the police, and captured weapons. So everything is a hodgepodge, everything is miscellaneous. Now the Volkssturm, if you've ever seen the film Downfall, um, you'll see the Volkssturm being portrayed there. And the Volkssturm were basically on every single battlefield, really uh, the German army from October, November 1954, right till the end in May, uh, May the 8th, 1945. Now the other interesting thing I'm going to talk about very briefly about the Volkssturm is, as I indicated before, a lot of the Volkssturm, along with a lot of Germans, frankly, were not that enthusiastic about the Nazis. Indeed, many of the men enrolled in the Volkssturm, I wouldn't call them opponents of the Nazis, but they were lukewarm at best. And as the war's coming to the end, the Volkssturm found themselves, particularly in the city of Munich, fighting the SS. So first of all, we're one of the very few formations who actually have the label of fighting everyone. We even fought the SS. And basically what happened in Munich, the day after Hitler committed suicide on the 2nd of May, a German military officer in Munich led an uprising, and the Americans hadn't quite reached there. The Americans were a day or two away. And rather than have the city taken by the Americans, they wanted to liberate it themselves. So the, this German officer um, rallied some of his own Wehrmacht soldiers and the local Volkssturm, and they attacked the SS headquarters and took it. And the following day, the Americans arrived and were very confused because what they found was the Germans, the Volkssturm and the Wehrmacht, had already liberated Munich. So the Volkssturm bizarrely claimed to have fought just about everyone on planet Earth, including the SS, but there we go. So that's the Volkssturm. So what we try and portray is, the, is, is an image of the Volkssturm in terms of the variety of equipment, the variety of weapons, and also reflecting the rather grim situation that it was in Germany at the end of the war. Because unfortunately, again, as many of you I'm sure are familiar with, apparently according to many television documentaries, World War II ended on the 6th of June 1944. The Allies land at Normandy and the war's over. Well, obviously that's not true. In fact, more sadly, tragically, far more soldiers died between June the 6th and May the 8th, 1945, than in all the preceding months of the rest of World War II. So in actual fact, unfortunately, we often neglect the actual hard fighting that goes on. So another sort of approach of my group is to try and also remind us all that in fact, on all sides, Allied side, German side, there was sadly still a lot of fighting to be done until the war came to an end. So thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. If you're interested in finding out more about us, do please visit us. Although I'm minded that in about 10 minutes we're going to be doing a, a, a skirmish, I believe. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.